the AWOL bag. The very definition of what it means to be a WOG. With the AWOL bag, you will be able to distribute yourself anywhere in the world with 20 minutes notice to move. The unit itself is highly portable, highly versatile, and always ready to go. With the proper configuration, one WOG can live out of his AWOL bag for up to three to four weeks at a time, bearing food. It is an outstanding system, which uh, can be transferred to any particular bag system. It's important to remember that this particular configuration is not the only configuration of an AWOL bag. I will give you my reasons for this configuration. Please feel free to adopt your own procedures and your own kit. This is an expression as an individual, and you and your own strengths and talents will have your own individual needs. bag is comprised of two separate units which combine together for the ease of transport. There's your mock bag and the AWOL bag itself. The mock bag will be covered in a different segment. This is the Mobile Operations Command Center. That's what mock stands for. Up here the AWOL bag. AWOL bag comes from the term absent without leave. AWOL. This is what you grab when you got to get out right now. Also called a bug out bag is another common term for it. In this segment we'll be covering the uses and deployments of how to pack an AWOL bag. The AWOL bag itself is the key component part that holds everything together. The actual AWOL bag is a, a combination of just smaller packages. Just as a person is a combination of arms and legs and whatnot. An AWOL bag is component parts put together. The first component part you have to decide upon is what kind of bag you wish to use. Now after a lot of deliberation, and I mean a lot of searching, I wound up choosing this particular bag. Now this bag here was uh, from the Royal Marines. It is a rucksack, I don't, I believe it's called a clamshell ruck. And this particular bag is the same bag that uh, the SAS used while doing urban operations. If you want to try to find this bag at an army surplus store, I picked up this bag from Dave's for 150 bucks. The strengths of this bag is is that it is compressive. It's designed to be used in airports. You could walk around. Uh, no one really looks at you oddly because you've obviously just got this little civilian bag here. It's just a, a regular little satchel. No problems whatsoever. I'm quite sure I could breeze through any airport of my choice. However, once you deploy to your zone, you're able to then turn this bag into the AWOL bag itself. The bag has transforming capabilities in that the uh, this side here flips up and can be rolled up as such. The straps are then tied off on the bag as such. This is important that you want to keep all your backpack straps in, especially if you're doing international travel, because airport baggage conveyor belts eat backpacks as a major staple in their diet. As a matter of fact, they have to destroy over 3,000 backpacks every year in order to keep the airport open. So make sure your backpack is not one of them. This is how it comes stock. This is the issue way they come. If you were gonna modify this bag, I would definitely recommend putting in buckles here so you could quick release. But other than that, the design of this is pretty solid as well. If you're so inclined, you could, you know, muscle out this uh, this waist strap they put on it here and give it so, some attachments here, like for pals webbing or what have you. But it's a very, very, very good system. So you can either wear it as a backpack like this. And again, it's quite small here. I mean, just worn like this, it's, you could use this as a day pack. You could use this as a patrol bag, just as such or what have you. It's a great bag for that. But for the AWOL bag, you're gonna be carrying a lot of gear. Now the name of the game is compression because compression eliminates unwanted space and gets your package smaller. Okay, you've gotta get everything nice and small. The more a bag can compress, the better it is. If you do not feel that you could fill a bag up with rocks and throw it around your yard for an hour, the bag is useless to you. Travel of any kind is unbelievably hard on any luggage or equipment, especially backpacks. And you have to be very, very careful with the backpack you use because if you get the wrong one and you wind up in a bad situation, 
situation overseas or what have you, you haven't got a backpack and you're in some really, you're in it pretty deep. Military kit is trained, designed by professionals for professionals, so that's why I'd recommend this. Now, this bag here, you can't really see it. On the inside here, if we get in close, you'll notice that, first of all, all the zippers are covered with a, a waterproof membrane. This is actually waterproof, not water resistant, because the inside of it, so it keeps your gear dry. Never believe that something is waterproof, ever. Always put redundancy in waterproof systems. This unit here, this is your internal frame, and it's an aluminum frame backpack that's on the inside. You must get a backpack with a frame in it. If you do not have a backpack with a frame in it for your AWOL bag, it's essentially you're just carrying around a glorified purse. You gotta make sure for your AWOL bag, you have to have a frame. You know, it costs a lot of money to get uh, one of these really high-speed backpacks that you pay upwards of $1,000. I think there is military kit available for sub $200 range, which will do exactly the same thing. Now inside of here, you have the two side bags. And this, again, expands out. It's all modular. Technology now is moving towards, for the modern soldier, a modular system. If something is broken, you just re replace that module. So the advantage of having a modular backpack is that if you're carrying little gear, you can still take your complete backpack with you wherever you go. And as you pick up more equipment, if you're on patrol, out and about, doing some shopping, buying groceries, whatever, you can simply expand your backpack and there won't be a problem. Once the side pouches are on the bag, you can either carry it as a duffel bag, the straps all fold up, or you can wear it like a pack. Now, in your AWOL bag, the first thing that you're gonna need is a full, complete change of clothes. No matter what happens, an AWOL bag is there in case everything's gone sideways and you need to be able to move. So you need at least one change of clothes at a minimum. Your change of clothes should consist of a shirt, t-shirt, you'd be worn as an undershirt, a set of underwear, your uh, dress shirt, and a set of functional uh, pants. They should all be civilian in nature. There is no Canadian Airborne Regiment, so this is obviously a civilian shirt. Here we have uh, blue Under Armour. I mean, what soldier's gonna wear blue underwear? Uh, you have a obviously very civilian Hawaiian shirt here. And of course, the Canadian military has gone away from these combat pants, so these are now civilian pants. Uh, and as well, blue socks. Who in the world would ever suspect such an individual? Now the way you wrap all this together, of course, is you take, especially with the Canadian combat pants, which is why these are uh, desirable, you take your boot bands, make sure they're all there, lay it all out, fold it so that we've formed a fairly straight line, tuck it all in, then take one leg, take one leg you fold it out to the side like this and you fold this back down now you start from the bottom here and you roll your way up keep it nice and tight the whole way try to keep this width the same the whole time you're doing it once here you take the pant leg and you reach inside as such and that goes over top and this gets pulled down over the entire garment now the reason for doing this is it decreases size its compression and if this should get wet you're only going to be getting the bottom pant leg wet before it soaks through all the other layers so even if this was immersed underwater for a few moments if you were to drag it back it would dry up much more quickly when you put the clothing on once together the drawstring in the bottom cinches up and you have a complete change of clothes ready to go you're going to need, be needing your survival gear. Survival gear should be kept in a container. This is your, your uh, micro devices. These are things like fish hooks, sewing kit, that kind of thing. I'm using an ammo can for my survival kit because I'm planning to be out there for a while. So you have to make sure you have a container that's waterproof and airtight. We'll be covering the actual contents of the survival kit at a later date. Also in here, you got to get up every morning. So when you want to get up every morning, you got to keep your hygiene up. Hygiene in the field is unbelievably important. If you become dirty in the field, it promotes disease. This is why short hair is great because short hair is very hygienic. It's very easy to clean. So you must have an ablution kit. This is just a shaving kit case where you keep your soap, all that kind of jazz, where you shaving materials, all that. It all fits in one case. We'll be going that over at a later time if there's a call for it. I have here a towel, which anyone who's ever read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy will tell you that any AWOL bag should have a towel in it absolutely this is a disgusting civilian towel which is some sad shade of green i put two canadian forces boot bands around it to try to make myself feel better but alas i cannot actually find an issue towel i'm sorry Moving along, we have the Ranger Blanket. Now, the Ranger Blanket is not actually called the Ranger Blanket. Uh, it's actually a poncho liner for an American poncho. Of course, you use the Canadian Forces boot bands on it to keep it closed. But this blanket is so incredibly lightweight and so incredibly warm that in a lot of certain situations, you can just use this as an emergency blanket to, to shield yourself from the cold, what have you. If you're with someone or you possibly have uh, refugees or whatever that you're trying to look after, this will keep people alive. I have personally, having only this blanket over very minimal clothing and as much and it's as extreme of temperature is up to minus 15 to minus 20 and I found that this blanket has been more than adequate if you use this in construction with a uh, Gore-Tex bivy bag you can almost go to minus 50 it's pretty amazing provided you don't have wind this is an amazing piece of gear that is surprisingly inexpensive you can pick this up at almost any American Forces military base it'll run you about $40 the only uh, thing that you do have to do with it is it is a little hard because it is so lightweight to roll up the proper way to fold any large item is as follows take the outsides move to the middle always 
always. Outsides, move to the middle. Is this small enough? No. Outsides, move to the middle. Outsides, move to the middle. We can create a little bit of overlap because this is such a lightweight material. That's about the right size. You fold one end in as such. You start from the opposing end and roll up. It's helpful if you have a friend who can stand on the other end. In lieu of that, you can just roll really, really tight. Keep most of the tension here. If you have a barracks box with you, you can clamp your uh, end of your ranger blanket in your barracks box, and you can actually get this surprisingly tight. If you have enough boot bands, there are people who actually have played football with a ranger blanket for uh, improvised sport munition. Once holding it as such, it's easiest I find. Plant it here, take your boot band, throw it around, and do it up there. That'll hold it, keep the tension on, spin it around, whip yourself in the legs really hard, and then do it up, and you've got a contained unit here. The ranger blanket we'll put together with the boot bands around it is unbelievably light, and weight is always your enemy. Back over here, we've got our towel, our ranger blanket, our change of clothes, our survival case. We have our evolution kit. Now we're gonna get to our more sensitive electronics. You're gonna need some communications gear of some type. Now this is just your standard, no name brand, <laughs> this is your standard, uh, you know, gigahertz radio. You can pick this up anywhere. It's important to have because th a lot of people are using these now. A lot of uh, WOGs have started taking these radios out and about with them just to see if they can randomly jump onto another band and communicate with them. This is why radio procedure is so important as well. If you don't have a, a walkie-talkie, you must have some method of comms, be it GPS uh, sat phone or you want to have your, your cell phone or you want to have a, a ham radio with you. You want to have something that gives you long-distance communications. You must have comms, okay? And especially if you're part of a group of WOGs, you must all have the same comms and have preset radio procedures so you can communicate each other, with each other in case of a major, major event. You want to have also a secondary set. This is not the set that goes with your essentials bed. This is a secondary set completely independent of your eyewear. If you happen to be so, you know, ge genetically dysfunctional as I am, where you have to wear glasses, uh, you want to make sure you got as many extra pairs of glasses running around as possible. To receive world broadcasts in case things have gone surprisingly sideways, and to make sure you've even, you're even on the same planet if you suspect you may have fallen through a dimensional rift, this is a small, short wave radio. This one here happens to be made by Grundig. Uh, I picked it up for about 40 bucks at my local uh, big brand, big box, you know, sort of multinational, core political, you know, slave wage uh, electronic store would have something like this. You want to have uh, a set of bear guard or uh, bear spray, capsium spray. This spray is to handle any wildlife, you know, with two or four legs that happens to give you problems. This here is an extra time piece. Now, this particular one is very, very handy because this is an old uh, Casio Pathfinder, which has a built-in compass. You should have a manual compass in your bag. You should have a manual compass, but if you don't have a good manual compass, you know, you got to push with the cock you got. Make sure that you get yourself a compass of some type in your bag. You want to also keep an extra wallet. In this wallet, you want to keep a thousand dollars cash, and it should either be in American funds, and as well, if, if you have the money, it's always good to have small gold coins. That's what a lot of special operations do when in foreign countries. You have, sh should have your travel documents, any essential ID you have. If you happen to have ID with a collection of names on it, have that ID in there too. This is your paperwork in one location ready to go at 20 minutes. Beneath this we have a laundry bag. It's just a net mesh bag but you'll see how that's used when we actually pack the whole thing together. Down here this is your webbing. Your webbing is kept in your AWOL bag because you cannot really wear this kind of equipment in regular everyday civilian use. People get really too excited. This particular model is a ripoff of some South African webbing, which uh, is for load bearing in the desert and whatnot. This is nothing more than a collection of pouches. We'll go over how to configure this at a later time, but it's important that you have either a vest or some webbing or something that fits on you that you can put a lot of equipment to carry with you. Remember, wherever you depart from with your AWOL bag, you may not be returning to ever again. So it's very, very important that you take only the most essential equipment with you. This has the ability to gather more equipment and bear it with you on your body. So this is why you want to have some webbing. I chose some South African webbing that may not be with you go with. There's lots of different ideas. Do a lot of research before you decide on webbing. There is no golden rule of webbing that is the best. That's a myth. To try to make a general issue load bearing system is, is ridiculous. Down here, we have something that every walk should have with them and readily and easily accessible. This is a first aid kit. I've taken a Canadian Forces C9 pouch and put the essential first aid gear in there. You can customize your first aid kit to how you see fit, but keep it small and light. You'll be walking around with a trauma kit on you because you got you don't have the time. You got enough to look after yourself. That's about it. One wog, one kit. A garbage bag. I would probably carry two or three of these, but it's important you at least have one ready to go garbage bag. And I'll show you why when we begin packing. Now in here, I've got 
a laptop. Now you want to get yourself an old laptop. Laptops have come down in price so far now. You should be able to pick up an old P2 266 laptop for probably a couple hundred bucks. There's nothing wrong with that unit. No, you're not going to be playing any games on it. If you need to make sure you keep your documents, settings, anything like that that you want to keep a hold of for communications when you set up your uh, you know, mobile operations center, you want to make sure you keep that with you. So the best thing to do is to keep the most recent data backup. Inside here, you want to have the most recent data backup you have on either DVD or CD. However, you can compress it down. There's all kinds of ways to make a complete system backup for the one in your house. Chances are, if you're going AWOL and you've got to get out now, make sure you destroy all of your data before you leave. It's your data. Don't leave data lying around. Don't be a data litter bug. If you leave your house and you're not going back there, somebody else is going to move into that house. They don't want to have bother having to format their computer. You want to make sure that you erase all the data on their computer. That's just being, you know, don't be a, don't be a, don't be a buddy fucker. You know, really. He's going to be getting a nice house, nice computer. It may as well be clean and ready for him to use. So just keep your data ready to go. As well. On the front here, you want to make sure you keep all your various laptop accoutrements. You want to have your Wi-Fi set up. You want to keep all of your, uh, uh, anything you need, your extra CDs, whatever. They all fit inside of this particular pouch here. I've attached a really, really pathetic Canadian Forces butt pack to these, uh, this particular laptop bag. And uh, it gets the job done. To go with your complete set of clothing, you want to make sure you get yourself a pair of footwear. You'll notice these are not boots. These are some cheap, no-name brand, like $20 special, made in some sweatshop in some foreign country with a, by a kid who has to piss in a bucket. These are nothing more than lightweight extra footwear. You can use sandals, you could use those aquatic sock things that surfers use. Another really popular thing to use is uh, rock climbing shoes because they're fairly inexpensive. They're less than $100 and they give you a certain stealth capability when you're working with minimal conditions. The way you pack your shoes is you put toe to heel, compress down, and unfortunately shoes by their very nature are hard to uh, pack. So that's why I've gone with these ones. After much delay, the shoes are together. Moving down, another garment you want to have with you in your AWOL bag, and this is super important. You can do what I did, and I would steal your buddy's gloves. <laughs> this is a, a set of uh, Kevlar line gloves. There's a, all sorts of companies that make really decent gloves. Go online, look for tactical gloves. Some people are really popular with the puncture resistant ones, so you don't get plague from people, you know, who happen to have it or wander around, you know, got needles and spines and everything. No, you want to watch that. But whenever you're dealing with any kind of physical confrontation for the kind of thing that logs get involved with, you want to make sure you've got gloves. They got to be tight fitting, got to be able to move. I personally prefer gloves without fingers, but if you're going to be going into a situation you're not aware of, protection is always best. You want to make sure you, you uh, use uh, water repellent to treat the outside of your leather gloves to keep them water repellent because you don't want whatever you're touching or dealing with coming in contact with your skin because it can kill you. As well, if you can get puncture resistant ones, remember you're going to be wearing these for a long time so your hands have to be able to breathe. It's disgusting when your hands get super sweaty and can lead to the inside of your gloves getting dirty. If it's not loosened in layers, it should be breathable. Now, in the AWOL bag, you need a tool. And the tool I have chosen to deploy in the AWOL bag is a tomahawk. Tomahawks, we'll be covering in, in, a, in a later segment, is a tool which you would use for both hammering and chopping. For the field, there's about a million different uses for a tomahawk. According to the worst case scenario daily calendar, what is taught and sold in general consumer mundane media is how to foil a UFO abduction. Step one, control your thoughts. Do not think of anything violent, upsetting. Extraterrestrial biological entity, the EBE, may have the ability to read your mind, so you wouldn't want to piss them off. Resist verbally. Firmly tell the EBE to leave you alone. No, go away. Resist mentally. Picture yourself enveloped in a protective shield of white light or in a safe place. Telepathic EBEs may get the message. That's right, picture yourself in a white ball of healing light. Your fear, the fear itself, is a white ball of healing light. I don't think so. As a last resort, go for the EBE's eyes. You will not know what its other sensitive areas are. Well, that's just not going to cut it for the WOG, so we're going to be discussing uh, the smaller edged weapons variant for personal defense against extraterrestrial weapons. You must understand that when investigating anything to do with the paranormal, we must eventually come to the realization there's a very strong chance that anything that is outworld related, be it extraterrestrial, interdimensional, something to that effect, they could be nasty. In fact, you cannot deny the fact that all of life is based upon conflict. One bigger thing eating a smaller thing, be it fire, be it fish, be it whatever. You know, everything always eats something. So man has no natural predators that we know of, but I think that we may just have that. And on the off chance, which is probably very likely that supernatural creatures are in fact out to kill us, eat us, and take our planet, we must be able to defend ourselves and our families. So from that, we're going to be going over some 
pretty standard edge weapons and other variants that you can use. In my own personal opinion, what I think might be a consideration for you to consider. Now, what we got here is starting with, you've got, you know, your traditional means of defense. You've got your throwing knife, you got your shuriken here. Now these, the throwing knives I find are largely just for show. When, when you, you start dealing with knives and, and axes and stuff, you're getting into, before the gun was created, you know, for several thousand years, it was all about the steel. It was all about the sword and the blade. That's what ruled the planet. And when you run out of ammo, your gun's a fancy club, so you gotta be able to go to something that's a backup. Now, naturally, you can't be walking around with guns, because, well, that's illegal. But you can walk around with certain knives, provided you have a reason to carry them. Getting into this sort of, this is kind of my own selection, I'll just point out the pros and cons of each. Every one of these is effective, and you must bear in mind, there is no one ultimate knife. You have all these gurus talking about, oh, this knife is good for this, and that knife's good for that. You gotta base on your size, body type, strength, mass. You might be able to give a guy who's 6'5 and 300 pounds a massive battle axe, but you give the same thing to Sim, man, He's dog food. So what I'd recommend is finding the right thing that works for you, and that's very, very important. And starting with the beginning, you got your daily carry, which I use a folder. Everyone should have a folder with them at all times. It's not just a weapon, it's a tool. Mine's a striker, already talked about it. Very good knife, there's lots of folders on the market, but if you're gonna go one step beyond, if you're gonna be actually investigating the paranormal and you believe that you could be running into a conflict, there's a few things you wanna think about. Cold Steel made a sanitized product. This one's made by Cold Steel. It's a, this is a, a Tanto, but you'll notice the tip is gone. That's because this is actually made of plastic. Well, not exactly plastic. It's made of a substance called Zytel, which is 49% glass. It's like a fiberglass resin combo. You sharpen it with a with a nail file you can get off of your saw. You just take the edge up. Very, very efficient, won't get picked up by metal detectors. This is very handy if you're going into nightclubs that you believe could be run by supernatural entities. Then you've got your the standard fare push dagger. This one's got a microtech clip on it, which you can pick from uh, I think it's microtech dot or techlock.com. Uh again, four-inch blade on it. Also made by cold steel. Great little knife, but again, very small, concealable. You haven't really got the punch. Moving up though we move into the Robert Tazula line where you have the Kudas. Now this is a design fighting knife. And a lot of people would say that these knives are amazing. Look at this, look at that. You know, they have all these different features that they talk about. But the problem with the new modern edge fighting knives is none of them are battle tested. And you cannot get away from stuff that has been battle tested. Battle tested, Kydex sheaths, all that stuff. None of it's been battle tested. People use leather sheaths because they're quiet, because they protect the knife. These will actually scratch your blade. So there's certain pros and cons to going with new technology versus old technology. When we get into old technology, the king of the edged weapon world is the Kukri, designed and made by the Nepalese. This is a Himalayan Imports Kukri, which I have sanitized. It's made by this little fella here, KS. It's all hand stamped, hand done. It's a quarter inch thick. I mean, look at the look at the thickness of that spine. When you compare, you know, handmade weapons versus factory weapons, look at look at the difference there. Okay, this one here is uh, an 18 inch Ancola, which is their heavy variant. It's exact same size as what the Gurkhas used in the Second World War. And in the land of doing supernatural exploration, generally now just purely for supernatural combat, now I would say in close quarters that the Kukri is pretty much king. Gotta bear in mind, any entity could be involved. If you wind up rolling around on the ground, this gets a little bit nasty and you have to invert and you're, you're doing lots of this stuff and you gotta be careful because it's very, very heavy. It's designed as a chopping implement as well as a weapon. So it's kind of a gladiatorial thing, but on the whole, I used to think this was the best, you know, chopping implement ever, but again, you got it, it comes down to personal taste. Now the problem with these is that they're heavy and weight is a consideration whenever you're doing anything to do with, with well, if you gotta hump the kid in, right? If you gotta carry it down a cave or a plank, you're going through a house. I mean, you know, all your kit weighs something, and this thing is heavy, which slows it down. And whenever you're dealing with any kind of edge weapon, you gotta remember, speed kills, speed is efficient. So when we turn the Wayback Machine, you start looking at different types of uh, edge weapons and whatnot. What I think is probably the fastest edge weapon you can make, it'd probably be, uh, I I'd have to go with the Tomahawk. And the U.S. Army Rangers also agree with me because they still have tomahawks that their troops carry. They're not issue, but a lot of guys carrying them are allowed to do it. That's from the U.S. Army Rangers, the Reed Rangers, in their first uh, set of orders. It says always keep your tomahawk sharp. And I believe that tomahawks are a very superior weapon. Now this is a this is one called a, a M and W Canada Black Hawk tomahawk. Very very inexpensive. You get these tomahawks. Cold Steel makes a variety of them off of uh, eBay. You can get them for less than fifty bucks. It's very very lightweight and it can be thrown. Now when you throw an axe, it's not like throwing a knife. Incidentally, there's no such thing as throwing knives. You can throw any knife, okay? Some knives are not designed to be thrown. Why would you throw your knife anyway? Because then you're throwing an item away. A tomahawk and a kukri. Comparison between the two. The kukri is, has a larger cutting surface and it would be good Depending on how you're doing your fighting style, I mean, some people say I use a tomahawk and a kukri. I don't know. I think that's getting a little excessive. You can only carry so many bladed implements. But when you throw them, you never, you, you actually, it's a, uh, the only way you can really do it is to throw it. You know, you gotta build yourself a little target, go outside and start screwing around, okay? When you huck it, you wanna bring it over top as such and you let it go here so that when you release it, you become aware of how it spins and moves forwards. 
You throw a kukri the same way you throw an axe. You do not throw a kukri by the blade, you throw it as such, and when you release, you're releasing it here, not like this, like here, so that you open your hand and then it gets out of your hand. So you can, you can get a lot of force out of a kukri, I wouldn't recommend throwing them, but they can be thrown as an improvised munition. At this range, you've got, uh, you know, a solid hit with your, 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 your tomahawk, and they are designed to be thrown. So you can, you, you can get at a, your effect, maximum effective throwing range, I'm maybe 30 feet from that target. If that was a, like an, either an EBE or an Outworld Entity or whatever, you've got an ability to engage that target at that kind of range. And then you can close with the Kukri. Now that's an idea, but again, you don't want to be carrying two things. Now the Kukri can be thrown the same way. The added bonus of a tomahawk over a kukri is, is that the tomahawk has a hammer edge which is designed for hammering. So you never really think about it, but if you've got to go through a doorway, you've got to break locks, you've got to hammer things, you've got an already built-in mace designed for that purpose. The tomahawk is battle-tested. The Indians killed hundreds and hundreds of settlers with these things. They're outstanding for hand-to-hand -hand combat. They're lightweight and you have a tool as well as a hatchet as well as a weapon. So in my opinion, I believe the tomahawk to be superior for the kukri for its versatility but as a purely combat weapon, the Kukri is probably better. For carrying purposes, I recommend the Tomahawk to Wogs. But now, what kind of Tomahawk do you use? If you go to these companies like RJC Forge or American Tomahawk Company, you're paying $400 for an axe. Not really the way I'd go. I would go with a wooden handle, however, which can be easily replaced because you are going to crack the handle off while practicing. Now, there's a couple of different guys who decided to make a combat Tomahawk. It's a fellow who cooked one of these up, and this is what the head looks like. Now, this was the Vietnam issue era tomahawk, okay? I believe the guy's name was Langolier or Langolia or Lang L something, and definitely a Vietnam tomahawk. And what he had was he put a, a, an edge here for catching. So if you were ever working with anyone, you had to trap them, it catches, and you can drag them in or what have you. You've also got the spike on the other end, you know, for going into heads and stuff. And you've got, of course, you know, the little bit of peak, and you've got your cutting area here. This is a combat-tested tomahawk, and it was very, very successful. The problems with it are is that the handle is very, very narrow. Although it is lighter than the old tomahawks, it cannot be used as a mace. It is purely a flesh chopping tool. And for this reason, I prefer the older tomahawks, which have multiple function, versus the pure combat tomahawk. Again, this is my only point. But you think, well, why not just get a hatchet? Well, the problem is when you start getting into hatchets, you get things like the East Wing Camp Axe. And an East Wing Camp Axe, this is an 18 inch hatchet, right? But you think, wow, that's the perfect tomahawk ever. The way it's constructed is all one piece of steel. Steel right the way through, down to the handle, the whole nine yards and you just paint it black to subdue it you've got this massive edge here if you wanted to be creative you could grind it you could sharpen on this side you know you've got this amazing tool problem again becomes weight because now you've got something which has more functionality than a kukri but weighs as much as a kukri and you've got the same problem so you've traded one one problem for another problem if you don't mind the weight if you don't mind the weight and you're going to be only on a like in a fixed position or something like that absolutely cannot go wrong and i think you should always have a camp axe in your car but we're talking purely as a carrying tomahawk these become too heavy. So in my opinion, rather than spending big bucks on some production weaponry tomahawk, I think it'd be better to just jump on eBay, spend 40 bucks, get a cold steel or a black hawk or a rifleman's hawk or something to that effect. There's all kinds of tomahawks out there that have been completely tested and tried and true. That's just my opinion though. My name's Sean Kennedy and I am the fucking man. Okay, I wanted to talk about the whole, do you want to be a crazy or do you want to be a clone? You know, because let's get right down to it. Let's cut through the shit. There are two kinds of people in the world. People who see things our way and people who are clueless. And you can apply this to anyone. And that's not even half as militant as it sounds. But it's like there's people who understand what's really going on. You know, that the government's corrupt, that there is there was no plane that hit the Pentagon. You know, they, they, they know the truth about, you know, they, they can't prove it, they can't point to it. But they generally know the direction. Yeah, they know the government's totally fucking corrupt. And, and they're trying to do what they can under the system so we don't all wind up in camps. You know, Sean, that's crazy talk. You know, that's not crazy talk. Is go take a look at the new major prison complex. If that's not an Americanized, bigger, better, you know, concentration camp, I don't know what is. To be honest, when you look at the whole structure we have now, you can either be a clone or you can be a crazy. And you gotta make a choice at some point about whether or not you're gonna fit in. Because, uh, I gotta tell you, there's a, a lot of benefits to fitting in. You know, Jesus. I mean, if, if looking back now, if I thought to myself, you know, Sean, fuck this man just just walk away you know just comb your hair and you know just jesus you know you know just go along with the bible stuff for a while you know just just go with it you meet a nice girl there and pretty soon you're believing it you know you're doing all right
try and get a nice little job, be a bricklayer, be a grandfather, you know, crank out a whole shitload of pups and, you know, die. That's your life. Punk. And then, you know, you think about that and you go, that's pretty preferable because every day when you're, you know, labeled a nut or you try to be an individual or artistic, it's, it's a trial. Every day, you know, you get up and, you know, you got a fresh set of new issues because you don't fit in and people are afraid of you and maybe they're interested in you or they want something from you or it's bizarre. And God help you if you get a little bit of notoriety too because then you get people who, you know, follow you around and stuff and think that you're cool, you know, <laughs> and they, they want pictures taken with you and stuff, which is all right, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind at all. I mean, I'd like to have my picture with Christopher Lee. Uh, that'd be, Chris, if you ever get a chance to watch this, baby, I'll do anything you want. W would you work with us? But no, seriously, like there's all kinds of people who I respect who are entertainers and I'd, I'd have my photo taken with them, but it, it's, it's like people make you into an icon and then pretty quick, you're believing your own bullshit too. Pretty quick, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I really am the fucking man, you know, look at me, I'm the shit, right? But the reality of it is, is it's, it's all, you know, just a uh, kind of a myth. It's not real. And to a lot of you who see that, they'll be like, whoa, what, what, what do you, what do you mean? Maybe not a lot of you, maybe I'm being generous. Maybe a few of you might, might feel that way. But everything is like that, you know? Marilyn Manson's just a guy. And if you met him, you'd be like, ah, well, there he is. He's long black hair. She had two arms, two legs. And when you start to realize that, those kind of bubbles get burst, you know, where Britney Spears is going to be forgotten. She's already being forgotten. It'll be the next teen superstar. It's, it's going to come to the point where everyone's going to start to go a little bit crazy because we all realize the bullshit. And everyone's going to realize that they should start being individuals. I mean, with the, with the internet, you know, luckily I, I hung around with those radical loner types. There's an awful lot of loners out there, you know. All the terrorists are loners. Everyone's a loner. All those protesters, they're all loners. Five, six thousand loners down there marching and holding hands and stuff. All loners. Yeah. Eventually, right now, in your life, you may feel that you're, you know, pretty beat on. You know, you might feel like you're, you haven't got a lot of friends and the people you have are kind of online and sometimes it gets scary at night and you wonder, shit, man, what if they're all right? What if I'm just this big geek loser? What if, what if I'm a freak? When that happens, you must realize that you're only a freak right now. And the younger you are, and the quicker you feel that way, the more people will be like you when you're, well, my age. You see? Everybody's slowly going bonkers. Everyone's slowly going mad. And this crazed youth with steel in their face and tattoos and... All that stuff. Well, that's the, uh, those are all the, the, the crazies. They were driven crazy because their families were taken away from them by corporations. They were enslaved and they took all their time. No time left for the children, so they, they went insane. And me, you know, I'm probably one of those insane kids too, but I guess I'm probably a try-by philosopher type. And hopefully I'm the ones who, who are into me, you know, just in case you're ever wondering. You know, the wog thing, we don't hurt people. Guideline one. I mean, we don't, we don't hurt people. That's, that's not, uh, that's not in the rule book. Hurting people is a, is a horrible horrible thing. Violence to defend yourself is a completely different thing than hurting people. Hurting people is, is a direct thing. The wogs don't do that. You understand what I'm saying here. It's, it's, it's the intent of the statement. We just don't hurt people. So, moving back to the crazies. The crazies on the whole have been driven crazy, and this is what all these kids are, and all of you who are watching, probably fans of mine, or mostly all the wogs are probably considered batshit bonkers. I mean, seriously, if you would call yourself a wog right now and say, yeah, I'm a wog. How many people could you point to who would say, yeah, I could see that guy being insane? Remember Dave? Dave said there watching me going, yeah, yeah, I could be a wog. You walk around his neighborhood, do you think Dave might be nuts? Well, yeah, probably. Yeah, he spends a lot of time on the computer, you know. You know, that's 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 the kind of shit you get. So gradually, you know, take heart, you know. If you're feeling bad because you, you're you're feeling like you might actually be loony. Now, everybody's going loony, man. It's not just you. Uh, that's why, you know, people weblog. You know, it, it's very, very apparent. So, coming back right the way around there to the clones or the crazies, it's better probably to be an individual because the clones aren't really a culture. They're fake. They're produced things. The Britney Spears, the, the, the Brady Bunch. You know, 90210, all that shit. It's all absolutely fake. It never existed. The Cosby Show, he's a comedian. Never existed. None of it's real. We're the reality. This is where the metal meets the meat. This is where it ends. I decide whether or not I'm going to murder this cow and eat it. Bathe in its blood. I will decide whether or not I will graze upon the foliage. I decide me. Further to that, I decide what I can and cannot put into my body. What I can and cannot put into my mind. But for some reason, we deny ourselves that basic right, that basic fundamental right. We always feel drawn to the television. And these attackers, you know, these assassins, these, you know, merchants of destruction who are slowly strangling everything it is to be human. You know, they're closing in on us. So, nature, in its natural wonder, has decided to bring about something like me, somewhere down the pipe, and all the wogs. And we're sort of the, the bit of a kickback for that. So, once again, clone or crazy? Everybody is crazy. Some of them don't know it. The people who are in denial of the fact that they're absolutely loony, 
are the clones. You see them everywhere. They live in fear. It's a, it's a horrible state to be in. I wouldn't want to do it myself, but that's just me. You know? My name's Sean Kennedy, and I am the fucking man. So you say you gotta know why the world goes around And you can't find the truth in the things you've found And you're scared shitless cause evil abounds Come join us